You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Good day, everyone. Welcome to The Dead Prussian podcast. This is the third episode in this podcast series, and I'm your host, Mick. I've been here for all three so far, and I plan to be here for all the rest. Thanks to everyone for downloading episode two, the discussion between myself and Vanya Eftemova Bellinger on Marie von Clausewitz, and in particular, the relationship she had with Carl and her efforts to get his works published. There were some interesting facts in that episode, so if you haven't listened to it, please check it out. Um, a quick spoiler, uh, Carl was a bit of a prude, whilst Marie was a little bit saucy. For today's episode... Myself and Dr. Donald Stoker, a professor from the U.S. Naval War College, uh, discuss Carl, his life and works. Dr. Stoker has written a book called Clausewitz, His Life and Works, and in it you can learn a lot about Clausewitz the man. Often we forget that the writer of a sometimes dry uh, tome on warfare and the theory of war was actually a, a combat soldier who took part in at least at 36 battles. G'day listeners, this is uh, Mick here with uh, Dr. Donald Stoker, who is a Professor of Strategy and Policy for the US Naval War College's Monterey Program at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He's the author and editor of several, seven books. His most recent work is Carl von Clausewitz, His Life and Work. He also has written a book, The Grand Design, Strategy and the U.S. Civil War, 1861 to 1865. And this actual book won the prestigious Fletcher Pratt Award for Best Nonfiction Civil War Book of 2010. Evening, Don. How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me. No, thank you very much for coming on the show. So... The reason I've uh, asked you to come on the show is our last episode went into a great deal about Marie von Clausewitz and the woman behind the great procrastinator that he was. <laughs> um, but for this episode, I thought, why not talk about Carl von Clausewitz, the man? So um, for the listeners out there, uh, there'll be some people that uh, may not have read your book or may not have uh, heard any of your talks before. So can you just give us a, a little bit of a uh, description about yourself, what you do, and why you're inspired to write about <coughs> Carl von Clausewitz? Well, I teach a, like you mentioned, I teach a class called uh, Strategy and War. It or it masquerades under various names sometimes. I basically teach uh, military theory, military history class for the United States Naval War College. That is part of our staff college training system, and I mostly have junior junior officers, O three, O four, uh, grade. And one of the foundations for our course is or military theory, and we we look at. Clouds with his own war, we look at Sun Tzu, we look at Corbett, Mahan, uh, and some others. And uh, I'd always read, you know, these theoretical works, you know, growing up since, since I was a child, really, some of them. But uh, I particularly got interested in uh, Clouds with his teachings, teaching it, and his writings, teaching it. And it's just uh, it's kind of an accidental way stumbled into it. I, if you had told me I would, 10 years ago that I'd be writing a book about this, I probably wouldn't have believed you. But uh, I would have also said the same thing about having written a book on the Civil War, you know, as well. So you never know where you'll never know where you'll end up. You are you definitely head of the game for Clausewitz. He also set himself the task of writing a book, and uh, well, his wife had to finish it off for him. So yeah, you, you got two up on Clausewitz. In fact, my, my <laughs> wife refused to finish this one. So. <laughs> so, so she did help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um. It's, it's an interesting uh, topic. As I said, Klaus is a man is um, very, very different to what a lot of people may perceive him uh, having just read uh, his one um, great uh, magnum opus. Klaus was both a combat and a staff officer. So my first question is, um, as an officer in the Prussian army, what role did uh, Clausewitz play in shaping the way the Russians fought in his time? Well, he had kind of a, a background role as far as shaping uh, the, the Prussian army. Uh, in in 1806-1807, you know, 
uh, the war between uh, France and Prussia. The Prussians are pretty soundly defeated, uh, which is well known. And afterward, you have this great Prussian reform movement. And Clausewitz is, hev Clausewitz is heavily involved in this at kind of a junior level and as a staff level. But he's working very closely with Scharnhorst and the other leaders uh, of the movement in trying to reform the army. And they're just trying to reform essentially everything about how the army fights, moves, acts, thinks, trains. And for example, he's involved in very much some nuts and bolts things in this. He helps write the infantry manual, for example, uh, and a lot of things like this, an enormous amount of logistical planning, preparation, an enormous amount of administrative stuff for several years. Uh, but he also uh, is, is involved, he becomes an instructor uh, at what later becomes the German War College in 1810, 1811, and part of 1812. He's teaching uh, there in Berlin. And he's teaching tactics. He's teaching what for the time would have been operations or strategy. He's teaching little war, which is uh, roughly, you know, uh, the doctrinal tactical elements of kind of a, a light infantry ir slash irregular type warfare that they had in the 18th century. And so, and this is where he's helping to shape the minds of, uh, uh, of, of a a lot of the men who are one day future leaders uh, of the Prussian army, certainly a lot of them are future combat leaders. And then in 1813, uh, 18, late 1812 and early 1813, he's very instrumental in helping uh, grow very quickly uh, the Prussian army uh, in the wake of uh, – in the wake where Prussia changes sides in the alliance system. It defects from the French alliance system and joins the Russians and then later the Austrians tag along as well. And Clausewitz helps raise that army, particularly the initial – Militia or Landwehr units that are raised in uh, East Prussia when East Prussia yeah. revolts. He draws – he bases it on some of his planning that he had done earlier mm -hmm. uh, to, to help create this. So there's a lot of things that are very, you know, very behind the scenes that don't necessarily come out or that people might not know uh, what he's doing to help build the Prussian army and rebuild it. And, and the reformers do an excellent job of uh, rebuilding the Prussian army. In 1806, the Prussian army could take a hit and come apart. In 1813, 1814, it could take a hit and say, okay, we'll take another and take another if we have to. So the, all of the reformers, uh, these men worked very hard and did a very good job. It's, it's interesting to note that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, he played a key role in um, reversing the, the Prussians' uh, side during the um, invasion of Russia. That's actually because he was, uh, he was fighting with the Russian army at the time. Uh, what was his influence upon the way that Russians fought, and was he involved in any key planning of the Russian operations against Napoleon? Well, it is, didn't have much impact, I would say, on the way they fought, but uh, one of the things, you know, famously the Russian army has this massive retreat in 1812 in the, in the mm. face of Napoleon. Everyone knows that, but the initial parts of the, the route of march for uh, one of these armies, uh, Clausewitz actually planned uh, mm -hmm. the retreat route for that and mapped it out because he had gotten himself attached to uh, some elements of the Tsar's staff, you know, in 1812. And uh, he, uh, the 1812 campaign, he has an extensive amount of experience in this campaign uh, from from day one until the, the bitter bloody end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, he spends, you know, much of his time in this 1812 campaign is spent in the rear guard. And why does he get into the rear guard? Well, you get into the rear guard because this is where you could see action. And part of the reason he went to uh, Russia in 1812 was to make a name for himself. And you're not going to make your name for yourself in an army if you're not in action. And so he fights in a number of combats here, and people don't realize – uh, some of the conventional wisdom is, oh, Clausewitz is just a staff officer. It sits in a cube in the German Pentagon and <laughs> writes these esot esoteric things that no one reads or no one wants to read. Yeah. Uh, but uh, a, the version of a staff officer, even when he is in a, on staffs during 1812 and later campaigns, much different job. You're much more involved in uh, the actual – well, for example, uh, his job in 1813 when he was on a staff is you plan the routes of march. You align the troops for combat. Uh, you're there in the li firing line, etc. So mm. it's not; it's a little bit different. But in 1812, he tries to avoid these duties because he wants to get into a combat unit. Because, yeah. well, you're not going to make a name for yourself otherwise. But in 1812, he's at just God, I, I lose track of the number of battles. He has a horse shot out from under him in one place, really? which means you're involved in it. Uh, he's at the Battle of Bordino. Mm -hmm. Which is a messy, messy place. Uh, yeah, it's one of the far. bloodiest, yeah, one of the bloodiest battles in the 19th century. Uh, there, 
He sees the Berezina, the crossing of the Berezina, the aftermath of that. He misses that just literally by hours and writes some really just horrific letters about what he sees there. Mm. Uh, and But the most important thing he does during that campaign is he helps negotiate the uh, General York, uh, the Prussian general from the Prussian Expeditionary Force. He helps negotiate the Prussian Expeditionary Force's changing sides and defecting mm. essentially to the to the anti-french cause and this has this enormous ripple effect because it leads prussia out of the war from that it just ripples and builds and you know i would argue that it, the, as far as his lifetime achievements of things he's, things he actually accomplishes that is probably the thing that has the biggest impact on, on what will happen on events in the napoleonic era Mm. It, it, it's quite interesting. It's it's not often you'll see a staff officer or a foreign staff officer attached or embedded with a foreign military told, uh, can you go and negotiate with the enemy? <laughs> you speak the language, you do it. Um, look, you've been a prisoner of war before, so you should be okay if you get captured. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, his, and his two brothers were in the other army as well. Yeah, yeah so both his, both his brothers, uh, they were serving, <laughs> they were older brothers, so they were serving um, in the army before he even entered. At, he entered at yeah. the age of 11 or 12, I think. Yeah, it, it depends on who you ask. There's some argument about the birthday, but 11 or 12, so it's a little fuzzy. It's quite, it's quite young, and uh, there's a lot of 17, 18-year-olds out there who are who are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed when they join the army. Just imagine an army full of uh, 12-year-old lance corporals. Um, <laughs> what, 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 in your opinion, do you think were uh, Clausewitz, uh, his career highlights? I mean, he wrote a lot to his wife, and um, he's, he's put a lot of descriptions of battle and tried to, tried to have his readers understand what a battle's like. Um, what were his highlights? Well, the, the thing I mentioned earlier, obviously most important, where mm. he uh, convinces the Prussians to change sides, uh, but he said, uh, I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but the mo most memorable day of his life uh, was the Battle of Lutzen where he took a bayonet to the head. <laughs> That's a pretty memorable uh, event. Yeah, I always tell my students that I would remember that uh, yeah. as well. That's something you probably don't forget. Yeah. The circumstances for that are a little fuzzy. The, all the Prussian staff ended up fighting in that battle because it yeah. was so intense, and it's, it seems to have been – uh, a cavalry charge against a French square, but okay. it's difficult to uh, just exactly pin it down, you know, into what happened there. Uh, but it was uh, he that was pretty memorable for him. Another night that he said was the most memorable uh, was uh, during uh, the Waterloo campaign, mm -hmm. uh, during uh, the retreat from uh, uh, oh, which battle? Retreat from Ligny, I think, yep. um, and where uh, he gets uh, pursued by French cuirassiers uh, after that, and he almost gets, gets pierced by one of them. You know? <laughs> so he, said, he wrote his wife and said, my hair turned white that night. Uh, so those were the things that he considered, you know, certainly, you know, certainly very memorable uh, occasions, uh, which I would remember them, I think, as well. I, I uh, think um, it's an important uh, point to note for a lot of the listeners out there and the readers of On War, you know, you get the impression of, a, uh, a stuffy theorist, but you know, he's he's got letters, he's got correspondence of you know being involved in some pretty um, pretty horrific combat action, um, demonstrating a fair bit of courage. And I I guess for all the headquarters staff out there that listen to this uh, podcast, there's probably about two of them. Um, it's <laughs> worth noting that even even the headquarters has to do a cavalry charge every now and then. Yeah, I think he was. I, I can place him in thirty six battles. Thirty six battles. Uh, in 36, I, I think it is actually more, but it's difficult sometimes to decipher it, for, especially uh, during the campaign uh, in 1792, 1793 in the Revolutionary War because it's such a bizarre back-and-forth uh, campaign. And some of the actions where I know he was at, he never wrote about them. He was very reluctant to write about his own – or wrote very little about his own combat experience. But it comes through in, in places and in some of his letters. Uh, some of his letters are pretty gruesome uh, sometimes. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, detail. I think uh, his, his descriptions of battle, um, and, and in your book in the in the first chapter, you've actually um, cited one of his descriptions of battle early on. And um, he's the way he writes it, he tries to make the reader um, uh, unsure of who his audience was. A lot of the time it was his wife, um, but just make them understand um, you know, what battle is and, and what it is to the soldier as well. 
Yeah. I think if his wife had led with the uh, preface stating that he'd been in 36 different battles, um, <laughs> a lot of people probably would have picked up on war thinking it was a combat memoir and at least got halfway through before they realised I'd been uh, tricked. Um, yeah. <laughs> He's known as a theorist and he's, he's shaped a lot of the way that militaries um, think. And a lot of people say Western militaries, but we know that his work's been translated across uh, multiple languages, including Chinese and Arabic. Um, but as a theorist, uh, did Clausewitz branch out into other topics or was his focus uh, solely on war? He, he mostly wrote on war as far as his theory uh, wrote on war, but he wrote a, a his first effort at this was a book called Strategy, mm-hmm. and then he wrote the the well known it's translated into English as the so called Principles of War. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he did write some stuff on politics, and he went got himself in a little bit of trouble later on for some of the things he wrote about politics and whether yeah. the Prussians should have a parliamentary democracy. Uh, but the bulk of it, the bulk of his writing on theoretical you know issues is is on war. But he does write an enormous amount of history. Mm-hmm. And in the nineteenth century he's actually known as a historian, not as a theorist. We think of him as a theorist, but yeah. he wrote, wrote studies of the eighteen oh six campaign, eighteen twelve campaign, of the wars in Italy, a little thing on eighteen thirteen. I mean yeah. the list goes on of uh things that he wrote. Yeah, uh, various studies, a study of the uh Frederick the Great, which I think someone is translating uh now. Okay. Uh, and his and his uh, a German historian just published his 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 lectures from when he was teaching at this at the War College or what became the War College, yeah. where he wrote the lectures on Little War uh, and other things, his lectures on tactics and so on. Well, his his work on Little War surely um, will uh, will quiet down some of the naysayers saying that the way that uh, guerrilla warfare and non-state actors have um, risen in the in the past few decades is is making his on war uh, a little bit uh, irrelevant. We'll get to that um, a little bit later, but it's worth hmm. noting that he, he was uh, fully cognizant of partisan war, I suppose, is what the English-speaking world was calling it at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's not quite the guerrilla warfare we've seen um, with the rise of non-state actors, but it is not a concept that was unknown to Clausewitz at the time. Hmm. Now, this is this is quite interesting, particularly for those of us that have um, worked with multinational partners. Um, how did Clausewitz come to find himself the member of a multinational force? If this is a, I could see why this would strike. This strikes people as strange sometimes today, the, yeah. especially the, the students I have, which are you know officers, and um, you know he leaves the Prussian army. Because he doesn't want to fight on the side of Napoleon in 1812, and so he joins the Russian army. This is actually not that unusual. Uh, in the 19th century, if you wanted to get experience and your country wasn't at war, you joined someone else's army. And it seems to almost always have been the Russians and the Turks because they're almost always at war with someone, usually each other. <laughs> so he, like a lot of other Prussians, uh, probably a couple of dozen at most, there's some argument about the numbers, he ends up in the, uh, uh, in the Russian army. Uh, but if there, because of some political machinations there's this effort to create this russo german legion basically of german exiles uh either people that left prussia or recruited from prisoners of war to create this unit as a political tool mm-hmm. and he is slated as uh one of the staff officers and the chief of staff for, for that but that kind of falls apart uh, and is delayed because of uh uh this disease epidemic that kills a lot of the people in the unit yeah. and so the war changes as well, uh, and the, the collapse of Napoleon's offensive and then the counteroffensive by the Russians. They start pushing to Prussia, and he gets attached to the Prussian army. There, he's still technically <laughs> in the Ru- Russian army, but he's attached back to the Prussian army. The king's mad at him still for leaving and some yeah. other things. and won't let him back in, but so they fight the initial part of the 1813 campaign, and then he's posted – to another unit, still still in the Russo-German Legion, technically, and then when the second part of the 1813 campaign opens up, the Russo-German Legion is attached uh, to this uh, larger army uh, uh, run by a man named Val Molden, who then suddenly makes Clausewitz his chief of staff for the entire corps, which he didn't expect to have. Mm. Uh, but this is an army 
that for us it seems you know kind of odd. But first, when you look at just the rest of German Legion, yeah, there are some Germans in there. But I found the uh, the rosters uh, for this, and you have Poles, Italians, Czechs, Russians, Hungarians. I even found two Americans listed really? in one two, of the cavalry. Two units. Americans. Two Americans. <laughs> How do these guys get here? You know, so, in other words, if you could fog a mirror and you would sign, they they were they would take you. Yeah. <laughs> they were even Frenchmen, French deserters, you know, as well. So he ends up chief of staff for this unit, uh, and they fight the eighteen thirteen end of eighteen thirteen into the eighteen fourteen campaign. You know, in this unit, and they it's technically it's a Russian unit, but it has attached uh, this unit that is technically Russian, but is not really Russian as far as ethnically. But then there are Russian units attached to it. There are British units attached to it. There are Prussian units that are attached to it, you know, as well. So it becomes this multinational core uh, that there are several of these like that. And the command is actually part of Bernadotte's army, who is, of course, a French marshal who becomes the Swedish crown prince and later the Swedish king. Yeah. So this is about as odd as it gets. Yeah, it's uh, – so. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 he, he, he leaves the Prussian army. Puts on a Russian uniform and then gets embedded back with the Prussians. Um, yes, you know, you just you just can't get away from it. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's not something that is uncommon these days. I mean, I, I guess it kind of is good for uh, people like myself um, to understand that you know multinational uh, coalitions are nothing new. Yeah, especially when there's a there's a common enemy out there. Yeah, and yeah. Napoleon did have a habit of making a few common enemies. <laughs> Um, my next question is one that hopefully um, is something that'll uh, stir a bit of debate amongst some of our listeners. You know, we talk about how Clausewitz is often quoted, rarely read, um, and he gets thrown around uh, quite a lot. We've seen, we've seen a lot of people talk about um, Clausewitz in lots of different ways recently, and there's there's some proponents out there that the the, the nature of war has fundamentally changed from from what Clausewitz uh, wrote about. Um, do you think uh, Clausewitz is still relevant? I can probably answer that question for you, given that you've written a book on him. But uh, yeah. is, is Clausewitz still relevant? And, uh, uh, and if so, how so? Yeah, uh, I think he's still relevant you know, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, I think one of the reasons why people automatically de- decry him as being irrelevant is, is based on tactical reasons. Or, oh, you know, the way wars tactically are fought now is so much mm. different than it was in the 19th century. But then that also shows they don't really under they really haven't probably read the book because Clausewitz doesn't talk about tactical things, you know, very much. He's trying to get us. He's and Clausewitz is also not telling us how to fight wars. He tells us how to think of, about fighting wars. Is a point Beatrice Heuser makes, which is is very the, the one of the critical things uh, to get, I, I think, from his book. You know, and, and how to think about wars in a bigger bigger sense, not just at the tactical level and the guys in the trench across the. The way there, what are the big forces driving what is going on? Why is this happening? Why do people do what they do? What are the effects of what, what is going to happen? So I think that's important too. And, and part of it is part of the reason why people say is irrelevant is just exactly what you said. Oh, it's no knowledge of guerrilla warfare, irregular warfare, or however we're classifying it today. And Cloudless has a section of the book where he talks about the people in arms, mm-hmm. you know, which is certainly derived from his experience studying that, studying the revolt in the Vendée during the French Revolution, studying the revolt in the Tyrol, uh, studying uh, particularly Spain. Uh, we know that he studied the American Revolution, you know, at least a little bit as well, because he actually mentions General Washington in one of yeah. his one of his letters. And something really less well known is that one of Clausewitz's jobs in 1811 and 1812 was to secretly go around Prussia and kind of look at certain areas and consider, well, how can we raise the people in revolt uh, mm-hmm. against the French and against the French occupation and. He spends a lot of time examining that, thinking about that, planning, you know, for this as well. And in 1813, part of what they do, part of his – when they raise this new army or expand this Prussian army, part of what they do is use some of his ideas from studying that to raise his militia units and, 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 and incorporate them later into the army. So he's thought a lot about these partisan warfare ideas. Uh, in uh, that are pr- prominent in the late 18th century, and 
you're starting to get a gel by the 19th century of partisan warfare than the, the more guerrilla that we think about from, that really starts in Spain and then later on. And tactically, what they do is very often the same, but maybe the ideas driving it aren't necessarily the same. Uh, but tactically, what they do looks very, very similar in the way they fight. You know, so, and he studied he studied as much of this as he possibly could uh, during this period. And his one of his mentors, in Eisenhower, in Eisenhower, uh, he he actually had fought in the American Revolution. He had been mm. one of the, one of the Hessian units had yeah, been Hessian over there. So he has a connection with that you know, as well. So. And uh, and your students, um, how do your students uh, go about um, grappling with Clausewitz? Are they uh, Clausewitz fans, Clausewitzians, or are they uh, they anti Clausewitz? It, it, I get a lot of different uh, a lot of different reactions. Uh, there's always a core group that are kind of resistant because it's this old book, and there's always a core group that are very interested, you know, as well. But I've found that. You know, a lot of the guys that I have in my classes now have sometimes, and I'm not exaggerating here, they sometimes have 10, 11 uh, combat deployments to mm. uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, because a lot of them are special forces officers. Yeah. And so these are guys who have been around the block, you know, yeah. to say the least. Or we have Marines with 40 months in Iraq, or I've had a number of Army officers with 45 months in Iraq and Afghanistan yeah, for deployments. So, so I start off by telling them that Clouds have been in 36 battles. Yeah, <laughs> and that gives him a little bit more credibility than normally he would have, uh, because he's not like me, as I tell them, not just some pointy head professor telling him about the yeah, book. He'd actually the guys who actually had done stuff. Got to establish you know? <laughs> early on. So yeah, he can exactly. Be part of the gang. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So <laughs> that's excellent. All right, Don. Well, we're up to the uh, the final question, and this is a question I ask anyone who comes on the show. And uh, by anyone, I've asked one other person because you're my second ever interview. Tanya um, <laughs> Eftemova Bellinger, a good friend of yours, was my first, and uh, you're my second. So you get the second chance of uh, finishing this sentence, and it's our uh, attempt to understand war and warfare on this podcast. So we always get our guests to ask. Uh, I always ask our guests to finish the sentence. War is. Well, I'll leave it to Carl. War, war is a political tool. <laughs> you know, so, and people will tell you it's not sometimes today. And here's another – back to your relevance argument. Say, oh, it's not a political tool. Look at groups like ISIS. Well, I mean war is a political tool for them. They just mask it with a religious ideology. Yeah, you know, it's, so. it's very, very – well, the, the, they wouldn't have uh, the terrain they've got if they didn't use war to uh, exactly. dominate, capture that terrain. Um, I think – Interestingly, uh, through the reading, you know, there's a lot of people who read Keegan, and Keegan's first line in his book is, war is not uh, the continuation of politics by other means. So right. it is a hotly debated question. We've also got uh, General Rupert Smith says that uh, war does not exist anymore. So um, <laughs> our, our attempt at this podcast is to, is to always challenge people's thinking, and uh, mm. we firmly believe that war still exists, and your uh, your Klauswitzian offering um, is <laughs> definitely along the the same lines that we received from Vanya as well. She she went the perfect quote from Klauswitz and said <laughs> that you um, couldn't offer anything better than Carl himself or Big Carl as I like to call him, um, Uncle Carl. Uncle Carl, yeah, he's, <laughs> well, he's he's been a good uncle to us all, hasn't he? I mean, I remember I remember cursing Uncle Carl when I was a a undergrad history student at the uh, at the academy. So he probably would have appreciated that. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cadets reading his book late into the night, um, cursing his name in a, in a, in a language he, he didn't speak. So, I mean, if it wasn't Prussian, he, he didn't even like the fact that he spoke French. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for appearing on the show, um, Don. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, for all those listeners out there, uh, Don's book, uh, Carl von Clausewitz, His Life and Work, uh, can be bought from all good bookstores, online retailers. I myself have gone through Amazon and purchased uh, the Kindle copy, which is actually quite a good format for highlighting, underlining, and taking notes yourself. So uh, check it out. And uh, Don, I hope you have a good day. Thank you very much. There you have it, ladies and gents. That was the interview between myself and Dr. Donald Stoker. I'll tell you what, I had uh, a lot of fun in that interview. It's uh, what some people may consider a dry topic when you're talking about 19th century Prussian history, but certainly not myself and certainly not Don. Uh, lots of laughs to be had. Episodes uh, two and three have given us a good understanding of Clausewitz, uh, his wife, and the background and context of the production of On War. That 
some pretty heavy uh, listening, some pretty heavy reading uh, for the time being. So next week we're going on to a different topic, just briefly discussing a few contemporary issues. So make sure you tune in next week for that. A quick shout out to all our Twitter users out there who are participating in the hashtag what is war discussion, offering some version of their own on the sentence what is war, the sentence I get every guest on the show to finish. It's uh, providing me with a lot of uh, food for thought. It's also interesting to see concepts such as cyber war and autonomous weapon systems driving the way that our perceptions on war uh, change. So it's great. I ask anyone who is interested and wants to chat with some very interesting people, use the hashtag what is war, tag us in at dead Prussian pod and join the conversation. But until then, grab a book and crack on. On the next episode of The Dead Prussian, Mick talks with Carrie Morgan, a debut author who is using fiction to raise awareness and address issues faced by contemporary war veterans. I've always been really fascinated by military history and really more so, like, especially the personal narratives of people's experiences. Those experiences deeply affected them and, you know, the things that they saw, the things that they did, it affected them for the rest of their lives. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution Licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.